This devotional address with Mike Middleton was given on May 26, 2015. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our devotional. My name is Jan Sharman, and I have been asked to conduct this meeting. We are pleased to have Brother Michael Middleton, the director of BYU's Cougar Club, as our speaker today. Mike has been the Cougar Club director since 1988, with responsibility for BYU's nationwide booster organization. He is originally from Centerville, Utah, where he attended Viewmont High School, then earned his bachelor's degree from BYU. While at BYU, he was president of the Student Alumni Association and went on to earn a master's degree in communications. Brother Middleton has also been an adjunct public speaking instructor, an Education Week presenter, and a script writer for Bonneville Communications, Music and the Spoken Word. He is married to the former BYU All-American track athlete, Laura Zog. They are the parents of three children, the oldest of whom will be a freshman at BYU this fall. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Michael Middleton. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is a pleasure to be with you. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, If the stars should appear only one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God which had been shown in the heavens?" End quote. Gazing upward into the blazing splendor of the night sky, we see thousands of distant stars and even more distant galaxies. This is truly amazing. And our reaction to it is equally remarkable. Think about what we do when we stargaze. Seeing the light that left some distant suns about the time Columbus sailed for the New World, we immediately start creating associations between completely unrelated spheres, stars that are tens or hundreds of light years from each other, and often even further from the Earth. Making such mental connections gives them familiarity and meaning, and we begin to see the stars not only as separate points of light, but as constellations, a scorpion, a hunter named Orion, or a Big Dipper. And admittedly, I am really bad at this. Maybe you are too. Looking at this particular group of stars, how many of you immediately thought, wow, look, there's a dragon? <laughs> look at those stars and be honest. What would you have called this constellation? Fortunately for Draco, he was named and known long before I was born. If it had been left to me, these stars might have been called the angry worm or very long and tangled kite string. <laughs> there are, however, practical uses for such astronomical ink blots. Try this. Show your significant other pictures of various constellations and ask what he or she, she sees. If his answers are various types of weapons or characters from Middle Earth, <laughs> or if she replies, I see a diamond engagement ring three out of four times, Perhaps you should imitate the ancient mariners who navigated by the stars and make a course correction. <laughs> One further proof of my own astrological incompetence. For many years, I thought I was seeing all of Ursa Major, or the Big Bear, which candidly to me looked a lot like a Big Dipper. In fact, I thought the Big Dipper and the Big Bear were simply two names for the same group of seven stars until a wise friend explained that the Big Dipper is not a constellation at all, but merely an asterism or part of a constellation. I learned that you must include another 12 stars for the Big Dipper to become the Big Bear. Now, obviously, I had seen those stars before, but I had failed to recognize how they connected to and expanded what I already knew. Similarly, in the few minutes we share together today, I propose to offer four points of light for your consideration in hopes by thinking about them together and by connecting them to stars already in your life sky, they will provide you with additional illumination and with greater direction in your life while at BYU and beyond. The first concept is simply this, work is work. Work is work and that's okay. It's acceptable, normal, expected, and part of the plan. Whether you are a BYU student, faculty member, or staff employee, if you don't like work, you have come to the wrong university and likely to the wrong planet. Schoolwork, missionary work, homework, and housework, the part-time job you have now, and the full-time career you may one day take on, each of these will be work in all of its four-letter glory. A former teacher of mine was well over 300 pounds when he went skiing for the first time. New to the sport and unfamiliar with the resort, he asked for directions, and a cruel stranger sent him to a black diamond run. 
Exiting the lift for the first time, he experienced a short-lived slide of sheer terror, which ended when he crashed violently, embedding himself into the deep snow at the base of a mogul. Now it was uphill both ways, and he was tangled in his skis and stuck, by his own description, like a beached whale in the snow. He found by gyrating his entire body, he could plow forward a few inches at a time. As difficult and painstaking as this process was, much more frustrating were the scores of experienced skiers speeding by him with no concern for his plight. Finally, a female skier swooshed to a perfect stop next to him and the several foot long trail in the snow that represented his efforts over the last 45 minutes. Do you need any help? She asked brightly. To him, it was so painfully obvious that he did. His temper got the best of him, and he looked up and curtly replied, No, lady, this is what I came here to do. <laughs> Insulted, or puzzled perhaps, she skied away, leaving him, <laughs> leaving him for another hour of belly flopping before he was finally free to hike down the mountain carrying his rented skis. On days that I feel stuck, when progress is slow or non-existent, when my life's tasks seem difficult, repetitive, or fruitless, when I have days that any help sought for seems unforthcoming or insufficient for my needs, it has helped me to remember that wonderful line, this is what I came here to do. And to recognize that life's work and life's struggles, even the most difficult and mundane aspects of our existence, are truly at least part of what we came here to do. The very injunction from Heavenly Father to Adam and Eve and to us as, our, as their posterity that we would earn our bread by the sweat of our brows implies that not every task in this life will be easy or enjoyable. Even with all His glory, God Himself talks about His work, and we would be well to consider, his, to consider and emulate His focus, His devotion, and His power of engagement. We learn that our immortality and our eternal life are His sole vocation. Nowhere in the scriptures are we told about God's hobbies, what He does with His downtime, or how many exciting vacations He has taken. It is both inspiring and frightening to realize that a being of perfect understanding and unlimited power is focused on and committed to our eternal growth and happiness. I testify that He works at this much harder than you or I do. Always our example. From His earliest years, Christ was ever about His Father's business. Jesus explained, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh wherein no man can work, and my meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work." End quote. We too then must work, remembering that we have been commanded to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. In verbs that are diverse, instructive, and powerful, the scriptures also lovingly command us to learn of the Savior, to strip ourselves of all uncleanness, to prepare every needful thing, to counsel with the Lord, and to come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. Not only are we to improve ourselves and repent of our sins, we must also be ready and willing to work in the fields of eternity to bless our own families and the lives of others. Those of you who are preparing for missions, please notice that the very letter that you will receive from the prophet will say, you are called to serve and you are assigned to labor. All of us would do well to clearly define where and how we are currently called to labor, recognizing that our work of necessity must always be inextricably tied to the work of our Savior and of our Father. We are to be men and women of accomplishment and action. It is inconsistent to expect God to guide our footsteps if we are unwilling to move our feet. Among the Savior's many miracles recorded in the New Testament is the healing of ten lepers who approached Him pleading, Master, have mercy on us. The Savior did, sending them back to their families, their friends, and their former lives. An important part of this story, however, that initially escaped my attention is how He healed them, revealed in three small but potentially life-changing words. Luke 17, 14 tells us the lepers were healed not standing on the roadside or kneeling at the Savior's feet, but rather, quote, as they went. And so it will be with us. As we act, our paths will become clear. Weak things can become strong. And seeds we've planted in faith will swell and sprout and grow so that we know of their goodness. Yet to all too often, in both temporal and spiritual matters, more of us talk the talk than walk the walk, or in this case, work the work. With the tasks that are your responsibility, do you sign your work with excellence, giving your best regardless of recognition or reward, or do you work just hard enough to get by? When I was a teenager, my father was called to be the Centerville Eighth Ward's welfare coordinator. I quickly learned what this meant. Each month, he was one of the volunteers, and so was I. 
We worked at a grain processing plant owned by the church where large bags of oatmeal and other products were packaged into smaller containers for use in the bishop's storehouses. Working by his side, I learned a lot from my dad's example. Although he was in his later years, he was often the one who climbed the steep ladder into the loft to buck 40-pound bags into the hopper while younger men joked below. Always he was the one insisting we finish the shift even when the quota was already reached. Every night he was the one ensuring the facility was cleaned and secured and ready for the next use, regardless of who stayed to help. He taught me without words that exactness, effort, and sacrifice should be part of our daily labor and that an obscure two-story oat plant was not only part of the Lord's kingdom, but also a proving ground for His servants. A second star to consider, time is precious. As we work, may we each consider that our time and strength are limited. One of the constraints of immortal probation is that we must be selective about how and where and with whom we spend our time. Mortality's arena of agency itself forces us to make choices. As immortal children of an eternal Heavenly Father, it is expected that we will not only learn to discern between good and evil, but also to choose wisely from among good, better, and best. On the east transept of the Memorial Church at Stanford University are engraved these mighty words, quote, The best thoughts, affections, and aspirations of a great soul are fixed on the infinitude of eternity. Destined as such a soul is for immortality, it finds all that is not eternal too short, all that is not infinite too small." End quote. As you choose your majors, your friends, and your classes at BYU, you are shaping eternity. The Savior instructs us, quote, "...settle this in your hearts, that you will do the things which I shall teach and command you." End quote. And then He teaches that all who are wise stewards over their own actions and resources should first sit down and count the cost of the things they want to accomplish. While life lasts, you have the unparalleled opportunity to change and to grow. It does not matter what mistakes you have made, what sins you have committed, how often you have failed, or how awfully you have fallen short of your dreams or your potential in the past. Your future days are spotless and beckoning. Unfortunately, none of us know which day in mortality will be our last. In 1989, I was a volunteer helping with new student orientation. That was the day I met Chris Felstead on the last day of his life. I found Chris on the ground where he had collapsed. He would never get up again. As we realized his peril, a friend started CPR while I summoned the paramedics. One of you seated here today may be the recipient of the BYU scholarship that bears his name. Funded by the endowment his loving parents created with the college fund set aside for him in memory of their amazing son, who was admitted to BYU but graduated to his heavenly home before his first day of class. The uncertainty and fragility of mortality remind us that every day is sacred and every hour is important. For whether you perceive that your life at this moment offers much or little, your life, the only one you have, is now. Poets and philosophers have observed that tombstones each have a birth date and a date of death, two dates that are often separated only by a simple dash. And yet the summary of our choices are displayed and the range of our individual opportunities in eternity are determined by what we do with the dash. Your time at BYU, just like your time in mortality, will have a beginning and an end. Choose wisely what you do with your dash. As you do, please remember that many of BYU's best classes are not found in the catalog. They have no official course numbers and are taught only for those with eyes to see, often in the simple examples of the amazing people BYU has drawn here to be your friends and your faculty, your co-workers and your custodians. For example, for me, Compassion 401 was taught by a loving former BYU professor named Douglas Gibb. Let me share a sample of the curriculum. I didn't know Dr. Gibb when I arrived for the first day of a communications class he taught. I only knew that the classroom was overcrowded and that before we could get started, he would need to dismiss many unregistered students who were now trying to add the class. Looking us over, he simply asked, How many of you are registered for this class? About two-thirds of us raised our hands. Read chapter one, he told us. See you on Wednesday. And with that, we were excused. I went into the hallway but decided to turn back and watch. Dr. Gibb talked to every student in the room. Where there was a necessity for graduation or other circumstances, he added someone, but mostly he just got to know them one by one. No one left the room without feeling his concern or receiving his help. Almost embarrassed, he explained, quote, I've just reached the point in my life where I don't want to offend anyone, not even my cat, end quote. <laughs> Both now and then, Dr. Gibb is the type of man I want to be. 
And over the short dash of my undergraduate time at BYU, I came to know him both as a friend and as a mentor. He changed my life and the lives of many others by the way he taught both inside and outside BYU's classrooms. Third, storms are certain. No matter who you are, your life will have storms. You will encounter discouragement, doubt, and defeat. The difficulties you will face will amaze and overwhelm you at times, but it is your very response to such trials that will build your character and determine your destiny. A student in the YSA ward where I serve as bishop once explained, quote, One of the life's lessons I've learned from playing video games is that if you find a path without any enemies, it doesn't lead anywhere, end quote. This may be the only actual valuable similarity between Halo and real life. <laughs> I beg you not to play thousands of hours trying to prove me wrong. Opposition in life is necessary, but setbacks and struggles need not become frantic fear or debilitating discouragement. A tall freshman girl who came to Provo from Kansas said her upbringing in the Jayhawk state had made her a good basketball player and an experienced trash talker long before she enrolled at BYU. Arriving on campus, she quickly found out when and where basketball tryouts would be and went to the Richards Building on the appointed day. Once there, however, her fears got the best of her, and though dressed and ready to play, she never went in. For three hours, she paced in the hallway, unwilling to leave but unable to risk failing at a dream so big. Many years later, she learned from the coach that BYU's basketball team that year had played all season one player short. The coach had been looking for a tall forward who could play inside, but the right girl never stepped forward. Please, make your life a series of risks taken and opportunities realized. Never back down when you have a talent and you know how you want to use it. This former student carried this experience with her throughout her life, and it gave her the resolve and the power to open many other doors, both for herself and for others. I share this story with her permission. Her name is Sherry Dew, the current CEO of Deseret Book who recently returned to our campus as a convocation speaker. All of us who plan to reach the tree of life must be prepared to encounter mists of darkness and to endure shouts of derision from a building that is both tall and spacious. Whether your intended career is in business, politics, science, sports, or music, there will be plenty of negative voices and a myriad of opportunities to give up or tap out. Consider the criticism and setbacks experienced by several prominent people along with the eventual outcome. Early in life, Albert Einstein was called the dopey one and struggled to speak. He was expelled from one school and refused admission to another. He worked as a patent clerk before changing humanity's understanding of the universe and becoming the personification of genius. Wilma Rudolph was born prematurely and contracted polio as a child. Eventually, her once paralyzed left leg was fitted into a metal brace in hopes she could hump somehow hobble her way through life. Instead, one step, one struggle, one race at a time, she endured until she became the fastest woman in the world and the winner of three Olympic gold medals. Thomas Edison was fired from two jobs and described as, quote, too stupid to learn anything, end quote. Before he died, he was the holder of 1,093 U.S. patents, including inventions such as the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and after more than 1,000 unsuccessful attempts, the incandescent light bulb. Another who faced great adversity, heartbreak, and failure once described his feelings in these words, quote, I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth, end quote. Abraham Lincoln also saved the nation and changed the world through his wisdom, character, and courage. So if you failed a test or had your heart broken or lost a loved one or an election or an intramural basketball game or been fired from a job, welcome to the club. You are now in the company of the greatest heroes in Earth's history. What you do next will make all the difference. We humbly worship one who was a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief who descended below all things. He was ridiculed and reviled and rejected and then betrayed in the closest and most cruel manner imaginable. The scriptures say he had no form or comeliness that we should desire him and that we hid our faces from him. Even as he was wounded for our transgressions, healed us with his stripes and engraved us everlastingly on the palms of his hands through the miracle we call the atonement. A fourth and final star, know who and whose you are. Our divine origin and our eternal possibilities should determine our aspirations, our attitudes, and our actions. One of the great examples of this idea of identity determining destiny was displayed at the 1997 NCAA Cross Country Championships. The national meet was held on a Monday, 
which meant Sunday was the last preparation day prior to the race, as the other team scouted the course, took training runs, stretched and strategized the BYU women's team, attended church, hosted a fireside, and held a team testimony meeting. The Sabbath day was sacred, and they were not willing to compromise. At their team meeting, one coach read these prophetic words, quote, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not be faint. End quote. Kesa Monahan, a five foot three sophomore from Hawaii, read the team from a less sacred text, the children's book, The Little Engine That Could, pointing out that the little engine is the only train in the story that is blue. At the race course the next day, the team gathered in a circle. They put their arms around each other and they prayed. On the tarp where they stored their bags, one of the team had written, We will win because we love each other. And because we love for each other, we will do for each other what is too hard to do for ourselves. When 184 of the best cross-country runners in the nation were called to the starting line, seven of them were wearing cougar blue. The starter's gun fired. Each girl did what was needed. Each trusted in herself, in her teammates, in her coaches, and in God. With four runners in for each team, the Cougars still trailed Stanford, but there was a chance, depending on the placement, of the fifth runner from each school. In the last hundred meters of that 5K race, Kesa Monahan was inadvertently knocked to the ground. Her teammate, Emily Nay, sprinted past her to finish as the Cougars' fifth runner and lock in BYU's score. Now, the championship depended solely on where Stanford's fifth runner placed. Courageously, Kesa got back up and beat the Stanford girl to the finish line, displacing her by one spot to give BYU the victory with a score of 100 to 102. They became the first BYU's team to win a national title, winning by the narrowest margin of victory in the history of NCAA cross country. President Worthen has invited us to climb mountains, both physical and spiritual, because he knows part of the strength that is a mountain becomes ours as we ascend. As we follow his inspired counsel, our views become broader. We draw closer to the divine, and like the mountains, we become steadfast and immovable. It was on a high mountain that the prophet Moses learned both who and whose he was. This mighty prophet, whose teachings and ministry are seminal to the beliefs of three major world religions, was powerfully taught face to face by God. You are my son. You are in the similitude of mine only begotten, and I have a work for you to do. The message was clear and repeated. Couldn't the same be said for each one of us? I testify that it is true, that you are a son or daughter of our Heavenly Father, that you have traits, gifts, and callings that make you like the Savior, and that our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have work for you to do. Moses would later stand against the most powerful nation on earth, feed thousands in the wilderness, part the waters of the Red Sea, and lead his people to the Promised Land, all because he knew who and whose he was. We come to BYU and attend church and read the scriptures not only to come to know about Christ, but to come to know Him. As we serve in our callings and in our communities, we are given opportunities both to be like Him and to become better acquainted. As King Benjamin described it, quote, For how knoweth a man a master whom he hath not served, and who is a stranger to him, and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart? End quote. As we come to know who and whose we are, it becomes easier to sign our work with excellence and to see our efforts not only as part of a personal test, but also as part of an eternal plan. Thought to have made some of the greatest musical instruments ever created while living in Italy in the 1700s, Antonio Stradivari was a craftsman whose name became synonymous with his work. In her piece, Stradivarius, writer Mary Ann Evans imagined the self-defining drive that might have allowed Stradivari to create violins that would come to define who and whose he was. Quote, when any man holds twixt chin and hand a violin of mine, they will be glad that Stradivari lived, made violins, and made them the best. The masters only know whose work is good, and they will choose mine, for while God gives them skill, I give them instruments to play upon, God choosing me to help him. For even God himself could not make Antonio Stradivari's violins without Antonio." End quote. Individually and collectively, our destiny lies in our ability to connect the points of light in our life so that we can see the broad patterns of eternity. As we work hard, choose wisely, overcome opposition, and exercise faith in the Atonement and the plan of salvation, we begin to recognize that our destiny is not to gaze longingly into the night sky, but to create and organize the stars and to dwell eternally in the heavens. 
The Savior himself has taught us, quote, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, end quote. May we truly come to know them as we work and study and serve at BYU and beyond. May we live each day with gratitude, deciding what we will do with our short dash of mortality. May we weather the winds and survive life's inevitable storms with courage and perspective that is fueled by knowing with ever more certainty both who and whose we are. And may we continue to connect points of light in our lives, recognizing that they illuminate the pathway home. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. This devotional address with Mike Middleton was given on May 26, 2015. 